I just need to Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, today's webinar. My name is Charlie Taylor. I'm one of the continuing education consultants here at the Department for Libraries and Archives, and I'd like to welcome all of you to uh, this morning's webinar on uh, Kentucky land patents. We're super excited for this um, to have uh, the expert in Kentucky on this topic. <laughs> so just a little bit of housekeeping, and then I'll turn it over. Um, in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, you can see a couple of um, downloads. Those will also be available at the end of the webinar, so you don't need to rush to get those right now, but you will be able to get the full-size version of the slides um, once we're done. You'll be able to download that directly to your computer. If you have any questions for Candy, um, or if you have any comments, you want to share anything, or any technical difficulties, please use the chat pod in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. I'll be monitoring that um, so we can, we can help you out with any of those things as the webinar goes along. And this webinar is being recorded, and it will be posted on our archived webinars page under the genealogy section within about a week's time. So you'll be able to come back and review any of the information. Um, share it, please. Share the link with anyone that you feel will be interested, your coworkers, your patrons. Uh, same thing with the handouts, with the slides. That's Candy has wanted to emphasize that that's yours to do with what you want. If you want to share it out to people, whatever you'd like. And it looks like the results of our poll looks like most people are um, have a little bit of experience researching land patents and tax lists, but a, a good chunk of you have not. So that's great. You're going to get lots of great information today. So I'm going to switch our screen over to our webinar. Give it just a second to load. There it goes. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and turn the webinar over to, to you, Candy. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our discussion of Kentucky land patents and tax lists. One of the first questions we are asked is, why the Secretary of State's office? For uh, the first, let's see, from 1792 up until the 1890s, uh, the Register of the Land Office was a constitutionally elected officer. There were some problems. We're not going to uh, say there weren't in the backdating of land grants and litigation. So the office was transferred over to the auditor's office. Then in the 1930s, there was a governmental reorganization that placed the duties of the register of the land office with the Kentucky Secretary of State. And with that being said, I send you greetings from the current Secretary of State, Allison Lundergan Grimes. She is very interested in Kentucky history and the preservation of our important records, which date back to the very formation of Kentucky. We are now in uh, an area with the records housed in a vault with the suppression system. And I, as a Kentuckian, thank her for doing that and looking forward to the preservation of the records by doing so. So let's move ahead. Anytime we think about Kentucky history and Kentucky land, we have to be aware of this man, King George III of England. He devised a way to pay soldiers who had fought for him in the French and Indian War, Lord Dunmore's War, and other conflicts. And he also devised a way to remind people on this side of the water that he was in charge of land appropriation, not those pesky surveying companies. <laughs> In his proclamation of 1763, which is available on the Kentucky Secretary of State's Land Office website in a link we'll talk about later, he set up a line, a proclamation line. All of the settlers could stay on this side of the proclamation line. The Native Americans would be restricted to the western side of the proclamation line. But as you'll see on the map, there were a lot of treaties that were being negotiated, including for that area that would become Kentucky. So we're going to be fighting a war against that king at some point in time. So somehow those settlers are going to start crossing that blue line. Charlie, how did I do with using that arrow? That was perfect. Thank you very much. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> you know, every day is a good day when you learn something new. That's it. So, 
This is a portion of that proclamation of 1763. In the second area, to every person having the rank of a field officer, 5,000 acres, to every captain, 3,000 acres, to every subaltern or staff officer, 2,000 acres, and to every non-commissioned officer, 200 acres, to every private man, 50 acres. See what he's doing? He's using land as a way to remind the people he was in charge of land appropriation and to pay his soldiers. I will say this before we go any further. Our program is going to be divided into three segments today. First of all, we're going to talk about the historical background of the land patenting process. In the second segment, we're going to talk about the terms that are used in land patenting. What is a warrant? What is an assignee? Some of the more popular questions that we have fielded over the years. And in the third segment, we're going to talk about research techniques. The examples that we're going to be using today are limited to just a few counties indeed, but the applications will apply statewide, not to just the counties being referenced today. So we shall continue. After the Revolutionary War, it is important to be aware of the fact that Virginia wasn't the state that we know of today. Virginia stretched from Atlantic to the Pacific. Kentucky is a daughter state of Virginia. You will see New Jersey is a small area on the Atlantic coast here. And then the Carolinas are going to stretch clear to the Mississippi River as well. Let's remember after the Revolutionary War, the United States government did not have a tax base with which it could pay the soldiers who had fought in the Revolutionary War. But the United States had plenty of land. So the same principle as land, as payment for military service, was used by the newly formed United States of America to pay the soldiers. Each colony devised its own system of payment, the amount of land that would be paid and where the military districts would be located. There are some states, and let's see, you know, back up here to New Jersey, that were border locked. They didn't have a western area or a lot of area that they could designate as a military district. So those soldiers didn't get any bounty land warrants until the pension acts were passed later on. But on the other hand, Virginia had quite a bit of territory to grant as payment to soldiers who had served. When people were coming into Kentucky, we wanted to spell one thought that everybody came through the Cumberland Gap and up the Wilderness Road into the heart of Kentucky. Charlie, I'm telling you, if Daniel Boone had been paid one dollar for everybody who claims to have come up that route, he would have died a billionaire. <laughs> but, bless his heart, that wasn't the case. Actually, these travel routes will let you know, probably, how they came to Kentucky. You're going to have folks that are going to access the warrior traces or the Native American trails that ran through Kentucky when the Native Americans were coming here to hunt, not necessarily to reside, but to hunt. You're going to have buffalo traces uh, or other trails that have been laid by large animals. They're going to form a path for people to enter. And of course, you're going to have the folks that are going to come from the Carolinas and the lower part of Virginia up the Wilderness Road into the heart of Kentucky through the Cumberland Gap. But another route that we overlook when we're talking about the people who were from Pennsylvania or Maryland was the water route. They went to Fort Pitt or Fort Redstone and they would find the Ohio River and then follow that around by flatboat. And then they would get off at Carrollton and catch the Kentucky River. Or perhaps they would just get off at Maysville and, and settle there. It's going to depend upon the type of warrants that they're going to carry with them, be they treasury warrants or military warrants. 
be these certificates of settlement or preemption warrants. The type of warrant will determine where they settle and how they can acquire land and possibly where they came from and the route they chose. We have some wonderful uh, state parks that honor Fort Boonesboro, Fort Herod, other, and St. Asaph, Logan's Fort. These are wonderful places to visit. We encourage you to do so. But let's remember, these are stockades when times were rough. The people would go there for their own security. But they didn't leave the home and hearth of Virginia or Maryland to reside within the confines of a fort. They came here for land. Many would settle in stations, a one-family station or a two-family station are drawn here as examples. These stations will become the beginning of our communities. Uh, you're going to see um, McConnell Station. You're going to see uh, Lexington grow up around that. I encourage you, if you have not done so already, to check your shelves, your library shelves, for the book Stockading Up by Nancy O'Malley. She talks about the early stations in the bluegrass, gives some genealogy about the families that came in, and also she plots out the location of the stations as well as possible on topographical maps. Stockading Up by Nancy O'Malley, and that is in your bibliography at the end of this talk. Now, what about those land claims? We've talked about the French and Indian War veterans may have gotten warrants and they crossed over that blue line. But let's go down to the settlers that were coming in across that proclamation line into Kentucky. Why do we need laws describing how land would be appropriated? As various and vague claims to unpatented land under the former and present government may produce tedious and infinite litigation and disputes, I have news for you, still going on, and in the meantime, purchasers would be discouraged from taking up lands upon terms lately prescribed by law, whereby the fund to be raised in aid of the taxes for discharging the public debt would be in great measure frustrated. The Virginia General Assembly approved legislation in May 1779 that addressed early land claims prior to the establishment of the land patenting process. Please note, that was just Candy reading a portion of the law. That is not Candy telling you what happened. We're using the legislation as our primary resource for our discussion today. And you can read that land law, 1779A, on the Secretary of State's website. We go by legislation. Sometimes we have to use that legislation to confirm research. Sometimes we have to use that legislation to correct research. Early Kentucky land claims, key provisions. All surveys upon any of the western waters prior to January 1, 1778, based on entries filed with the county surveyor prior to October 26, 1763, would be honored. There was a 400-acre limit. These would be the King's Proclamation Warrants. Then Virginia said future proclamation claims would be limited to Virginia veterans or warrants issued by Virginia governors. This law excluded land claims for service in companies or militia detachments. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why you don't see bounty land warrants issued to militia companies out of Boonesboro, for example. They had to be Foot on the ground soldiers out of Virginia fighting uh, in the Revolutionary War or in the French and Indian War. But notice we are going to honor the French and Indian War warrants, mainly because a lot of the soldiers who fought in that war fought in the Revolutionary War later on anyway. So they're, you know, being taken care of for both uh, military uh, efforts. One of the books that I enjoy working with in the land office is a calendar of the warrants for land in Kentucky granted for service in the French and Indian War, abstracted by Philip Fall Taylor. We're going down the list and we're going to see that warrant number 759 
was issued to John Hall, deceased, because he was a sergeant in Phillip's company. He was paid 200 acres of land. The land was surveyed November the 23rd, 1783, by Daniel Boone, Fayette County, on a small branch of Licking, and the tract adjoined Daniel Boone's settlement. What in the world is a settlement? We may find that out today. This is the warrant. This is the actual warrant. You do not have to go to Virginia to see the warrants and surveys and land office copies of grants prior to 1792 when Kentucky became a state. Those records were transferred to Frankfurt shortly after our statehood. They are housed in the Secretary of State's office. Now let's look at this. Land Office Warrant number 759 to the principal surveyor of any county within the Commonwealth of Virginia. This shall be your warrant to survey and lay off in one or more surveys for Elizabeth Hall and Sarah Hall, legal representatives of John Hall deceased. His heirs or assigns. Let's remember the double S will look like an F in this old style of print. The quantity of 200 acres of land due under the said Elizabeth and Sarah for military service performed by the said John as a sergeant in Captain Phillips Company of Rangers in the late war between Great Britain and France according to the terms of the King of Great Britain's Proclamation of 1763, certificate of which is duly uh, presented. Received under the, proven, received under the land office, given under my hand, and the seal of the said office on this 21st day of March in the year 1780. Right, now, Charlie, you're sitting beside me here, so we're going to do this together. Do you see any mention of an address like 1406 Elizabeth Street in Lexington, Kentucky is where he's going to have this land. I do not. You do not. <laughs> it's, it's vague and that's for a purpose. It's so it can be assigned over or transferred to someone else who wanted to use several warrants to patent land. Do you see anything here that says uh, that uh, uh, this is restricted to men? The no, warrants? No. Issued to two to women. women. Mm -hmm. Right. Elizabeth Hall and Sarah Hall, legal representatives of John. All right. He is deceased according to this warrant. He is deceased before March 21st, 1780. How do we know that? Because it's the date of the, the, date of the warrant. The date the warrant is issued. He's already deceased. Mm -hmm. And it's going to the heirs or assigns. In this case, we're going to see legal representatives of John Hall. So this book is very handy in order to track the French and Indian War warrants. I would flip that warrant over, in other words, turn to the uh, reverse side to see if indeed they assigned that over to someone else because that's where the assignments would be located. This is similar to a Walmart gift card. The, the Commonwealth of Virginia has just given these two ladies 200 acres to find, go shopping with, okay. The only thing is it's going to say, you know, you're going to use it within the confines of Virginia because of the title at the top, to the principal surveyor of any county within the Commonwealth of Virginia. Admittedly, they were supposed to use it east of the proclamation line. It didn't happen. The original survey is part of our file, but it did not scan very well for this presentation, so I have included the land office copy recorded in the land office survey book for the 200 acre survey that was done for Elizabeth and Sarah Hall, representatives. 200 acres of land on a military warrant, duly entered, what in the world does that mean? We'll find mm -hmm. out lying and being in the county of Fayette on a branch of Licking, adjoining Daniel Boone's settlement. Then we proceed with the meets and bounds description. You will see that on the right, down in the right corner, Daniel Boone is the deputy surveyor. 
Thomas Marshall is the surveyor of Fayette County that reviewed this survey. We'll go through the other elements of the surveying party when we get to that section, but we see that they did not assign that warrant. Elizabeth and Sarah are proceeding with the surveying of 200 acres in Kentucky on a branch of the Licking. Another book that I have just really come to appreciate is the Virginia Colonial Militia Land Bounty Certificate Book by Crozier. I used it to find out in the lower left-hand column John Hall, Sergeant and Captain William Phillips Company of Rangers in 1763 till legally discharged. Okay, said John Hall is since dead and William Lipscomb is the guardian to Elizabeth and Sarah Hall, co-heirs of said John Hall. Louisa County, March 13, 1780. Hall is a uh, a common name. How in the world would I know how to track down John Hall in Virginia? With this book, I know to narrow my search for his will to Louisa County and any other deeds and marriages and so forth. If you don't have that book in your holdings, I recommend it highly. Now, we've seen about the French and Indian War soldiers. Their heirs or signees using warrants to Patent land in Kentucky. What about those settlers? Bonafide settlers upon the western waters prior to January 1st, 1778, were entitled to 400 acres of land, including their settlement, if they could prove they had planted a crop of corn or they had established a, at least a one-year residency. 400 acres, Charlie, that's not enough. Land. I mean, look out. You saw how big Kentucky was. Mm -hmm. We're, we want a little bit more than that. <laughs> so the land law said settlers could purchase a preemption warrant to patent an additional thousand acres adjoining their settlement claim. So let's see. It's early here in Frankfurt and it's raining. Between the two of us, surely we can figure out what 400 acres plus 1,000 acres would total. 1,400? I'm coming up with 1,400 <laughs> acres as well. So they were entitled to a 1,400 acre patent if they could establish residency in Kentucky County prior to January 1st, 1778. That's the date. When I see somebody receiving a certificate of settlement, I know they had been in Kentucky prior to January 1st, 1778, and they brought their witnesses in to prove it. Now, persons who settled upon the western waters after January 1st, 1778, were entitled to a 400-acre preemption warrant claim, which included their settlement. December 31st, planted a crop of corn, 1,400 acres. <laughs> January 1st, 400 acres, so it's all in that date. Now, persons who had marked out claims and built any house or hut or made any other improvements prior to January 1st, 1778, were entitled to one 1,000 acre preemption warrant if the land commission approved their claim. I call these the chop claims or the lottery claims. That's when Abraham Chaplin takes 15 men out and they explore uh, western Mercer County and they he even has a river named for him, the Chaplin River. They're seeing a lot of land that hasn't been appropriated. One, one might blaze a tree here, one might blaze a tree there. Then they could file for a lottery claim of a thousand acres or up to a thousand acres on that chop claim. They did not have to have residency, nor did they have to plant a crop of corn in order to get that thousand acres. This is a way to pay those who literally blazed the trails and uh, found you know, land that was going to be subject to appropriation. This is also going to pit the settlers against the surveying companies. See what's happening here? Mm -hmm. Which law do you follow? Your surveyors or do you follow the law that has just been written by the Virginia General Assembly? All locations made by officers and soldiers by lands of actual settlers were declared void. 
And we're going to still see those 1763 warrants being used to patent land. Revolutionary War soldiers who had tried to use their bounty land warrants in an area outside of the military district will not be able to have those patents issued or those claims honored. I do have a question. What, what's meant by Western Waters? Western Waters is going to be the area, very good question, that area that will become Kentucky. Uh, it's Western Virginia. Virginia stretched from the Atlantic to the Mississippi. So you've got that proclamation line in place. Anything past that is going to be your western area. And that's what these land laws are addressing. Who is going to decide the, the amount of land that a settler can receive? Do you just take their word and give them a certificate of settlement for 400 acres and let them purchase a preemption warrant of 1,000? The Virginia General Assembly addressed that in the land law. Whereas the claims of various persons to the lands herein allowed to the inhabitants in consideration of their settlements and of those who by this act are entitled to preemption at the state price, as well as of the settlers on the land surveyed for sundry companies by orders of council, may occasion numerous disputes, the determination of which depending upon evidence, which cannot without great charge of trouble be collected, but the neighborhood of such lands will be most speedily and properly made by commissioners in the respective counties. The Virginia General, uh, General Assembly mandated the establishment of commissioners to go into the areas designated as Monongahela, Yohogania, and Ohio into one district, the counties of Augusta, Botata, and Greenbrier into one district, the counties of Washington and Montgomery into another district, not to be confused with Springfield and Mount Sterling, and the county of Kentucky shall be another district. There will be four commissioners appointed to attend meetings in each of those districts and listen to the claims by the settlers and their witnesses so the commissioners could decide the type of warrant that would be issued. A 400 acre, a 1400 acre allotment, or a thousand acre chop claim. That's what the commissioners are going to decide. Not a job I would have wanted to have. The land commissioners for the Kentucky district heard claims for certificates of settlement and preemption warrants from October 14, 1779 through January 26, 1780. Their circuit included St. Asaph, or Logan's Fort, Harrodsburg, Falls of the Ohio, and we all know that to be Louisville, Boonesboro, and Bryant Station near Lexington. People would come to them and bring their witnesses to establish their claims to land. But what about the Revolutionary War soldiers who had fought for Virginia? Didn't we just see that Virginia stretched from the Atlantic to the Mississippi? Where are they going to reside? The Virginia General Assembly was very clear on the establishment of a district. No entry or location of land shall be admitted within the county and limits of the Cherokee Indians or on the northwest side of the Ohio River, or on the lands reserved by act of the assembly for any particular nation or tribe of Indians, or on the lands granted by law to Richard Henderson and company, he will be the only surveyor who will receive an allotment for his services with the Transylvania Surveying Company. He will use that allotment to pay the people who work for him, he will divide it up into lots, make his money, and uh, that he will be the only one that will be compensated. The county that arose out of Henderson's grant is Henderson County, Kentucky, and the name of the city is Henderson. Or in that tract of country reserved by resolution of the General Assembly for the benefit of the troops serving in the present war. Again, this is not Candy telling you where the military district is, 
This is Candy telling you from the Act of the General Assembly approved by Virginia that established this first military district in Kentucky. Bounded by the Green River in a southeast course from the head thereof to the Cumberland Mountains, with the said mountains to the Carolina Line, with the Carolina Line to the Cherokee or Tennessee River, with the said river, see another name there for the Tennessee River was the Cherokee River, okay, with the said river to the Ohio River, and with the Ohio to the said Green River, until the Father Order of the General Assembly. That is from Land Law B, 1779. A map is worth a thousand words, so let's take a look at this. Okay, I'm really going to be good with this arrow before this mm -hmm. is over. The General Assembly of Virginia said that you could not patent land that was still belong uh, that still belonged to the Native Americans. The lower third of the Jackson Purchase was Chickasaw. It did not cede to the United States until 1818. We will have a separate set of patents identified as, as the West of Tennessee River military and West of Tennessee River non-military. But until 1818 and the land laws that were set up in 1820 by the Kentucky General Assembly, this area could not be used for land patenting by settlers or Revolutionary War soldiers or French and Indian War soldiers, for that matter. We are going to have a strip of land down to the 3630 latitude that is going to fall under the south of Walker's Line patent series due to a surveying error. Uh, this is done later on in the uh, early 1800s, but the bottom line is we do have land patents in Kentucky that were really for land in northern Tennessee. Tennessee agreed to honor those patents in exchange for roads. The other Native American area was the Cherokee section of southeastern Kentucky. It was not ceded over by the Cherokee until 1805. This will form the foundation of our Teleco land patent series. The session was made in 1805. The land laws were written pertaining to that area in 1810. Under this, you could not buy a warrant that would proceed with the patenting process unless you were white. This is the only patent series that I see that had that provision. I think it was to discourage the Native Americans from buying back their own land, but that's just speculation on my part. The proceeds from the sale of the warrants in 1810 would be used to finance the state militia. There's going to be another conflict coming up with Britain in 1812. Kentucky is going to use the sale of land warrants to help finance their militia mm -hmm. and to dress their troops for battle. Here is your military district. Hi there, Logan County. <laughs> Hi there, Warren County. Every time I pass into uh, uh, western Kentucky and cross that bridge, uh, Green River Bridge, I'm now in the Revolutionary War District. It ran from the mouth of the Green River, then over to the area that was reserved for the Cherokee. All other areas here are going to be available for patenting by using certificates of settlement, preemption warrant claims, treasury warrants, uh, and other types of warrants that you see here. Primarily, treasury warrants for northeastern Kentucky. This is where this is going to be. That's where you see the land specula speculators coming in. So, this is our map that depicts the location of the military district, the Native American reserves, and the rest of the area that is going to be available for patenting. Our first series of land grants will be known as the Virginia Patent Series. 9,441 patents in that series. 1792 is when the old Kentuckys kicked in. There are 7,668 patents in that series. Altogether, there are over 100,000 land patents pertaining to Kentucky land. 
Here are the increments of payment for the Revolutionary War soldiers. The book that I have mentioned here uh, by Lloyd D. Bockstruck would be another asset for your library. It identifies the amount of land each soldier or sailor would be paid. Soldiers or sailors, 100 acres for Virginia. Major General, up to uh, 17,500 acres. Gone are the days when we thought that only officers received bounty land warrants. That simply isn't the case. But each soldier would be paid by that particular new state with a, a reserve, uh, with a, a bounty land warrant that matched their rank and their time of service. That warrant had to be used in the specified military district. Another aspect about Bockstruck's book is that in the front of the book, he details the location of the various military districts, where they were located. The veterans who had served out of the North Carolinas, for example, had to use their bounty land warrants in uh, Western Carolina and even into Tennessee. They could not spend their bounty land warrants in Kentucky. We welcome them here uh, to collect their pensions, but mm -hmm. they could not spend their bounty land warrants here. That's a very good book for you to have as far as the identifying the various military districts and where the records are housed. There went my cannon. It just blasted off. Okay, <laughs> I forgot to click that that second time. <laughs> now, computers are wonderful things. Sometimes I uh, want to run down the hall screaming, but uh, I have used uh, filters to be able to determine the information that is now posted. We were able to filter out the types of uh, ranks that were identified in the Virginia Military Warrants Registers and see exactly how many warrants were issued to specific ranks. 4,745 warrants are recorded in our register in the land office and you see that the bulk of the warrants were issued to soldiers, 2,677 to be specific. We have 340 warrants that are identified as being issued to lieutenant. Uh, so this way we can get a handle on how many of each rank uh, were actually uh, uh, sent into the warrant stage. Some of the veterans felt their service was a patriotic duty, so they may not have applied for a warrant at all. Kentucky's getting close to separating from Virginia. We're getting ready to uh, get out on our own, fly with our own feathers. So the Virginia General Assembly realized we're going to have to have another district for those Virginia veterans who have not yet used their warrant in whole or in part. So a second military district was established, and it is in Ohio. We do not have records of the Ohio bounty land warrants here in Frankfurt. You would contact the Ohio Historical Society, but you can also see them on the Bureau of Land Management website, and we're going to share that link with you in a few minutes. But the papers will be in Columbus, Ohio, not with the Secretary of State's office in Frankfurt. This is a depiction of the Ohio Military District reserved for Virginia veterans. And if you'll notice, it's going to run along the Little Miami River, but it's also running along that Ohio River. And I can see Virginians coming through and getting an offer they couldn't refuse for that Revolutionary War warrant and perhaps they wanted to stay in beautiful downtown Maysville. So they sold their warrant to someone who used it across the river in Ohio and used that money to finance a purchase in Mason County. That's entirely possible and probably probable. Okay, we've talked about soldiers, French and Indian War soldiers, Revolutionary War soldiers, We've talked about settlers and their certificates of settlement and preemption warrant claims. But what about speculators? 
Ladies and gentlemen, there were speculators in the 1700s just as there are today. They're going to want to acquire land, but they didn't serve in the military, or maybe they served in the military and they don't want to receive a warrant because, as we said, they felt their service was patriotic. Or maybe they didn't get here in time to qualify for that 1,400 acres. Maybe 1,400 acres wasn't enough. Maybe they didn't want to come to Kentucky after all. They wanted to buy warrants and have an agent go out and find land. Then if the patent did go through successfully, they would pay that agent a portion of the patent. In Land Law B, approved May 1779, the General Assembly said, for creating a sinking fund and aided the annual taxes to discharge the public debt, be it enacted that any person may acquire title to so much waste and unappropriated land as he or she shall desire to purchase on paying the consideration of 40 pounds for every 100 acres. We have seen hundreds of thousands of acres patented in Kentucky primarily around northeastern Kentucky under the authorization of treasury warrants. And perhaps the buyer never set his foot in Kentucky. His loss. Okay, So the, the, we have seen soldiers' warrants, settlers' warrants, speculators, and seminaries were also given the right to treasury warrants to have land patented it in various areas of Kentucky and then use that money to finance their colleges or higher, uh, higher institutions of education. We used land space. We used what we had. We used the land and we sold that off by various types of warrants. Anytime you research Kentucky history, you have to be aware of the county formation tables. From seven, in 1772, Virginia formed Fincastle County out of her western frontier, those western waters we talked about, Fincastle County, Virginia. It is going to stretch, actually, to the Mississippi, but remember, not over the Chickasaw land. From Mississippi, clear over to that proclamation line. The county was too big to resolve land disputes, court disputes, whatever, or file a deed. So Captain Jones and George Rogers Clark went to uh, Virginia, the seat of government, and said, let's break this thing up. This is too big. So Kentucky County, Virginia was formed in 1776. The remainder of Fincastle County was Montgomery County and Washington County. Anytime you see some old records and they identify Montgomery and Washington County, it's not going to be within our border at that time. It's going to be the former areas of Fincastle County. In 1780, Kentucky County was divided into what we call the Big Three. Jefferson County, County Seat Louisville. Lincoln County, County Seat Harrodsburg not Stanford at that time, Fayette County, County Seat Lexington. All three of the original three counties converge at one point where the Benson Creek flows into the Kentucky River. Now I'm not going to put Charlie on the spot on that one, so I'm going to tell you the answer <laughs> to this one. The place where they converge is downtown Frankfort. I wish you could see the look on her face. Right now, I'm really missing the camera aspect. I had no idea. <laughs> right? When you're down at the Historical Society or the Farmer's Market, for example, uh, you're in Old Fayette County. When you get out of the car and you take the little nice sidewalk walk around the, by the Kentucky River, you will see an area where Benson Creek flows in. You're standing on the Fayette County side, you look to the right, you will see old Jefferson County, and you look to the left, and you'll see old Lincoln County. Franklin County was formed out of Woodford County, daughter of Fayette, 
Mercer County, daughter of Lincoln, and um, Shelby County, daughter of Jefferson. You have to be aware of your county formation dates. And with that being said, records did not transfer when a daughter county was formed. If you want to look up old Mercer County records, you're going to have to look at old Lincoln County records. You don't know how surprised people are when they call me and they want to know why they have to look at Fayette County records because uh, they live in Pike County, for example, or they live in Breathitt County, or they live in some of the areas here, Mason County. You're going to have to go back to the mother and the grandmother counties to see those records. Your county just didn't appear from out of nowhere. It's the daughter of another county, of a former county. All records will trace back to Kentucky County. We do have some records that are identified as Kentucky County or even Fincastle County. We have a few of those. We suggest that researchers study the uh, text of the acts creating Kentucky counties to get the formation uh, years as well as the actual act creating the county because there can be some information in there of historical value. Uh, you'll see the Cove Spring here. Uh, you will talk about, uh, sometimes they will give you the names of the people who are appointed to identify the seat the, of, of the county here. Uh, we're mentioning an old wagon road from Boone's old station to Harrodsburg crosses. Uh, a lot of historical information there, not just for the 120 counties, but also for Beckham, Henrietta, Robards, Castle, Kentucky County. It's more than just the 120 counties, ladies and gentlemen. You can research the text of all of the acts that uh, uh, pertain to the creation of Kentucky counties, even if the legislature didn't actually approve uh, the creation of that county. The bill was submitted. We have that on there. We've talked about the history now. We're ready to start the actual terminology. And you've heard me say the word warrants more than once. You've seen a French and Indian War warrant. Anyone who got a warrant or bought a warrant still had to follow the rest of the process in order to acquire title to land. Warrants did not convey title. They're just a full, uh, step one in a four-step process. Now, if you go into different areas of the country, they will tell you that the grant is the patent. I encourage, and they're right, but the bottom line is, you're going to miss out on the history of that patent. Why was the warrant issued? Who were the assignees? When did that happen? I encourage our researchers of Kentucky history and genealogy to look at patenting as a process. You want to see as many steps as possible to understand why that grant issued. The first step, the warrant, synonym, certificate, commissioner certificates, and some patents are even authorized by special acts of the General Assembly. Their function is to authorize Step two, you may have a military warrant, certificate of settlement, preemption, treasury, clearing a road, purchase from the county court or the Kentucky land office, or uh, by act of general assembly. A variety of warrants are used in the land patenting process in Kentucky, not just for military service. Step two, the filing of an entry. This is where land is reserved for step three, the actual survey. The early Kentucky, Fayette, Lincoln, and Jefferson County entry books are available from the Kentucky Land Office, with the exception of the early Kentucky and Jefferson County. Those books are housed in Louisville, but we do have them on microfilm. Many of you may have that microfilm in your holdings too. 
Subsequent entry books are kept on the county level. Let me share a story with you. Uh, several years ago, I was giving this similar talk to the county clerks of Kentucky. And uh, I saw some porch lights come on in their eyes in one area, uh, a section of that room. And I got a call about three days later, and it was the county clerk. And she said, we have something to tell you. And I said, what's that? And she said, because we attended your session, we realized the book that we had put in the basement of our courthouse was one of those early entry books. And I said, where is it now? She said, it's not in the basement anymore. <laughs> we brought it up here. <laughs> I said, I, I thought that might be the case. But uh, uh, the entries include the date of filing, the name of the applicant, and we appreciate them for calling that to our attention. That lets us know that they understood the concept of the entry book. Entries include the date of filing, the name of the applicant, and the type of warrants being used, the warrant numbers, and the location of the land to be surveyed. Entries may be withdrawn or amended. You check the marginal notations. Entries do not convey title. This is what the map of the early entries would be. Fayette County entry books, I think there are four of them all total that are housed with us. Uh, then we have the Jefferson entry book on microfilm with the Kentucky County entries in the front. Then we have the Lincoln entry books that are on our website. You can search and see the images from those, uh, and we'll see that in a moment. But you'll notice the military district, even though it is a part of Lincoln County, it has its own separate set of entry books. There are two of them. The northern part of the Jackson Purchase is going to be Lincoln County because it's the southern part that is still Chickasaw. So we've got uh, what happened was George May was the surveyor for Kentucky County, Virginia, and he was given his choice of the three counties to work. He took, he took Jefferson County. So he recorded those uh, Kentucky counties in the front of the books. Now I'm hesitant to show this because I can just see everybody running now to try to find this land. But it's of <laughs> historical interest, so here we go. Okay. This is from the old Lincoln County Entry Book, Book 2, page 299, filed May the 17th, 1788. Robert Breckenridge and John Filson, as tenants in common, enter a thousand acres of land upon the balance of a treasury warrant, number 10117, about 60 or 70 miles north, uh, e northeastwardly from Martin's Cabins in Powell's Valley to include a silver mine, which was improved about 17 years ago by a certain man named Swift. Yes, at said mine, uh, and then the said Swift uh, reputed he has extracted from uh, the ore a considerable quantity of silver, some of which he made into dollars and left at or near the mine. Sit down, Charlie. You've got to stick this out. You can't be running out. <laughs> Certain for a silver mine, together with the apparatus for making there. Okay, so we've got the entry that was filed for Swiss silver mine by Robert Breckenridge and John Filson. The date was May 1785, and uh, specific date May 17, 1785. What you don't see is the word surveyed. This is as far as it got, Charlie. They had a treasury warrant. I know you're disappointed, honey, but there's nothing. Okay. They got the treasury warrant. We even know the number. They filed an entry with the Lincoln County Surveyor, even though they cite Powell's Valley. Okay, but there is no indication it was withdrawn, amended, or surveyed. But we do have the recording in the Lincoln County Surveys book, Surveyor's Book. That was step two. It's just that step three did not happen. What was step three? The actual field survey. That's when the county surveyor or his deputy will go to the field and they will walk off in meets and bounds the land that's being patented. Sometimes they'll do a walk around or perimeter survey 
and then tell you you're going to have to exclude patents within, but the bottom line is they were supposed to depict and describe the track being patented. There will be a plat drawing. There will be a list of warrants being used, the name of the persons for whom the survey is being made, the county in which the land is located, the closest water course, not necessarily on the water course, but the closest water course, meets and bounds description, surveyor, deputy surveyor, if applicable, Shank carriers, housekeeper, pilot director, they're all the same. They just make sure the law is being obeyed when the survey is being done. The marker who will blaze the trees. Many will have magnetic variation and then the date of survey. Surveys may be assigned just as warrants can be assigned. Surveys do not convey title. The surveyor would use Gunter's chains. These uh, would be used for measurement. He would use, uh, I learned a new word at Boonesboro a few years ago, so hopefully I can say this right. Circumferenter, that was the compass to determine the bearing. They would use a transit to determine the arc. Key, one pole or one rod is equal to 16 and a half feet or 25 lengths. If that gunter's chain is four poles long, how long is the chain? If one pole is 16 and a half feet long, how long is a four pole chain? And I just saw you take a drink of coffee, Charlie. So I'm going to ask you to carry the two. Oh <laughs> I know you're being put on the spot. This really isn't fair. <laughs> 16 and a half times four. I think it's going to come up to 66 feet. 64, 66. Yeah, yeah you, it's like carrying the two. Everybody does the same thing. All right. 66 feet long. If it's a two-pole chain, it will be 33 feet long. Now just imagine packing those chains around the mountains of eastern Kentucky. But that's how they measured. Then they would use um, a marker to blaze the trees. I don't see someone here. He's holding a, a pole for sighting, I think, this surveying party, uh, uh, reenacting team. But you've got your surveyor, your county surveyor, using, and, and if this pole, if this was mounted on just one stick, so to speak, that would be a Jacob's rod. This is mounted on a tripod. Here they are measuring using those chains. One chainman, second chainman. You see the same principle of chaining for measurement used today, but not by Kentucky surveyors. If I don't say that, I will never hear the end of it, and rightly so. <laughs> but if you ever have the opportunity to go watch a football game, you're going to see downs measured off in what? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Charlie, you mm -hmm. can say. Yards. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Ten yards, but how are they going to measure the yard? Uh, with the chain. With that, there the you go. You get an A plus. <laughs> yeah, they chain, don't they? One on each end. And uh, these are not always uh, family members of the person for whom the patent is uh, being conducted or the survey is being conducted. These can be fellows hanging around the surveyor's office that day and needing some work to do. <laughs> so now we only have one area in Kentucky that's mapped by ranges, townships, and sections, and that's the purchase area. The rest of the state is mapped by meets and bounds. Distances meets bounds to corners. Pretty interesting, isn't it? I don't see how they did it, but they did. And they did it well. They used magnetic variation as well. Picture again is worth a thousand words. Let's look at this. June the 12th, 1785, surveyed for Henry Bell, 2,000 acres of land by virtue of a, what kind of a warrant? Is this Revolutionary War? It's Treasury. Treasury warrant. It's a bought warrant, ladies and gentlemen. Number 9250. I can use the Treasury Warrants database on the Kentucky Secretary of State's Land Office website to see who purchased that warrant to confirm it was Henry Bell or whether someone else bought it and then sold it over to him. Duly entered. Got the warrant. We've got the entry. It was filed January 15, 1784. 
and of course the entry had to be filed before the field survey could be made. Adjoining William Hughes, lying in being in the county of, and he marked that bourbon and put Fayette, and bounded, meets and bounds, 800 poles, so forth, 400 poles, and then back to the beginning. Here is the shape of this track that's being patented. And he is giving us a, a citation of the Kentuck. What river do you think that might be? Let's go with Kentucky River. And that was the way Daniel Boone was spelling it on that day. So here's Daniel Boone, deputy surveyor. He conducted the field survey. The document was examined by Thomas Marshall, SFC, Surveyor Fayette County. The chainmen are identified on the left, Septimus Davis and William Brooks. We know they were the ones that were carrying the chains to measure that tract off. And then William Hill is the marker who's placing the trees that are being used as corners. That was his job. Sometimes on these uh, uh, drawings, you will see little footprints and talking about the road into Kentucky. Uh, we've had uh, researchers use these old surveys in order to uh, plot out roads. They weren't interested in the genealogy, but they were interested in the history of it. We have also had naturalists study these old surveys to determine what type of trees were in Kentucky. And also, they could uh, identify the location of the cane breaks. Lots of usage for these. But these, this will be the foundation for the history of that 2,000 acre tract. It was surveyed for Henry Bell. The fourth step is the issuance of the grant, either by the governor of Virginia or the governor of Kentucky. And this will finalize the land patenting process, warrant, entry, survey, grant. The governor will repeat the meets and bounds description. He or the lieutenant governor will sign the document. They will recite how the patent came to be, what type of warrants, assignee of, assignee of, assignee of, and so forth. Conveyances after the grant is issued or filed with the county clerk. Remember your county formation dates. There's no central deed registration in Kentucky. Conveyances may be recorded as deeds are included in will bequests. And at this point, I'd like to compliment the Kentucky Department for Libraries and Archives for its efforts to work with county clerks statewide to preserve our county records because those records that are filed with the county clerk are the only copies. I've had too many instances where people have called the land office and said there's been a disaster or that was destroyed years ago. I want to see your copy of it. Ladies and gentlemen, there are no copies. They are housed on the county level and it's important for KDLA uh, and for the county clerks to work in tandem to make sure that those records are preserved for the future. I didn't get one dollar for saying that. I just want you to know that. <laughs> but I wanted you to hear it because you need to support your county clerks and preservation programs. Mm -hmm. All right, now, this is the land office copy of a grant that was issued by Thomas Jefferson, not as President of the United States, but rather as governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia. And he is granting title to a particular tract, meets and bounds, uh, and then we have, this is the land office copy of his signature here. But let's go through these numbers again. Conveyances after that grant would, uh, were, uh, was issued will be housed on the county level with the county clerk. Hopefully those records are still available. Warrant plus entry, plus survey, plus grant, equals a patent. That's the process. And if you only look at this one, you are not going to understand the assignments that occurred before that grant came to be. Okay. We've talked about history. <laughs> We've talked about terms. Everybody ready to do a little bit of research? Let's go. A book that you have in your repository or your library is by Willard Rouse Gilson. It's called the Kentucky Land Grants. And in it, he lists 
the land patents that were issued by Virginia before Kentucky became a state in 1792. You will see a grantee, that's the patentee, the person who got the grant, the amount of acreage, the book, that's the grant book page in the land office, the page in the grant book in the land office in Frankfurt, the date of the survey, the county in which the tract was located, may be in a different county now, but this is what the county was when the patent was issued, and then the water course. I will give you a little hint. One of the, uh, well, it was Ancestry. They indexed these, and they had the information on their website. There was a mistake that was made during the indexing process, and it was causing some confusion until we were able to identify the problem and contact them, or some researchers did. When they did their initial indexing, they put the grant book number, but then they used the page in Gilson's. So I'm afraid some people who were trying to find the grant book who had the wrong page number, and these records are on microfilm, a lot of repositories, would have been out of luck. But they have since taken the page numbers off. They have not added the correct page numbers, but they do have the book number. And I know that I can look in my records and I'll be able to pull that up. So uh, don't get discouraged if you hear we don't have a page number 1090. No, they don't just because there is one in Jilson's, okay? So for today's examples, we're going to look at Nathaniel Logan. And we see he got a 1,400-acre tract. Hmm. Sounds like one of those certificates of settlement and preemption warrant claims we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. didn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay, in Lincoln County on Dix River. He also got another tract of 500 acres. Grant Book and Page in Fayette County on Falling Timber Fork. Were they the same Nathaniel Logans? Was it somebody uh, or two different people? You know, uh, one has a tract of 1,400 acres here, and another one has a tract of 500 acres in Fayette here. Is this all there is? How can I find out more about Nathaniel Logan? Another book you have in your library, I'm sure, is the Master Index Virginia Surveys and Grants published by the Kentucky Historical Society. This doubles the amount of names that you can research. We're going to disregard the KHS volume number. That's not something you need to be worried about. That's a land office uh, reference. The original survey number, I need, okay, the original survey, did I just turn off my arrow? Let me turn it back on again, okay. All right, the original survey number is actually uh, the patent number file. The name of the person for whom the survey was made. You will notice it might be a different name than the grantee. The acreage, the county, the water course, the survey date, and the grant date and where to find the grant book. Okay, this book has a cross index at the back. Even though the title of the book is Master Index Virginia Surveys and Grants, it's about Kentucky, Kentucky land. I've seen some libraries place that in their Virginia, State of Virginia book, and that's your call to make. But the bottom line is, it is about Kentucky. It's about our Kentucky land patents that were issued prior to 1792. All right, now let's go down here to Nathaniel Logan. He's our subject of research. All right, he received two patents, 445 number one, 445 number two. One was for 400 acres on Dix River, and the other one was for 1,000 acres on Dix River. Where can I see the records? Have I got something to show you I think you're going to enjoy? <laughs> I'm going to open up the Kentucky Land Office website. We have given you the URL here, uh, down at the bottom of the page. But look at the links 
that are available. You have, first of all, Kentucky cities. Uh, you have uh, uh, military warrants, non-military warrants. There's the cities. Uh, online resources. Uh, the online order form, I'm not too pleased with. Sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. But we do have contact information for those that want to send us a letter. But if you want to see some patents from the Virginia and Old Kentucky series, you just have to make a few clicks. All right, let's go here. We're going to go to non-military registers and land records. In the first paragraph, you will see a link to the acts creating those Kentucky counties that we talked about earlier. All you have to do is click that, key in the name of the county that you want to see, uh, and the text will be available. And then also there are some uh, lists and so forth that you might find and frequently asked questions that you might find interesting. All right, then we have the four steps of the patenting process, even though I know this crowd doesn't need them because they've already uh, memorized them. <laughs> Charlie, they've got that down there. Okay, <laughs> then we've got the one-page document that talks about the one of the nine major groupings of patent series and the patent series overview. Uh, then we have the Certificates of Settlement and Preemption Warrants database. And we have a link to that Virginia Treasury Warrants Register so we can see who purchased that warrant that Henry Bell used to have Daniel Boone survey that tract in Fayette County. And then we also have the Lincoln County entries and we have uh, some wills that have been scanned and put online for you. As we find wills when we scan, we add those to this separate uh, website. We've got the Jackson Purchase Locator for, uh, that we're going to see in use in a few minutes. So we've got several things there for you to open up, and each of those will have more pages underneath those. Let's look at the Certificates of Settlement and Preemption Warrants database first. We're going to uh, see a, a channel called the Doomsday Book. This is uh, uh, a find that came, well, hello, okay. It just clicked on me, didn't it? We went live. <laughs> hello. <laughs> yes, I do want to close that current tab, don't I? Okay, yes. and then I want to go back, right? Minimize it. Minimize it. Minimize it, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, we just had there that. You. Okay. <laughs> Well, here we go. Oh, wow. <laughs> I had a friend tell me once that uh, uh, he did his presentation such as this uh, live uh, and used the internet, and he had died three times doing that. <laughs> and I decided I would just have PowerPoint slides that would show the links and not go live. And so we just saw that happen, didn't we? Did. we? <laughs> I'm very impressed. Okay. Well, we're still here. We will. Okay. And we've got the. Uh, a uh, Doomsday Book, which was found here at the Department for Libraries and Archives in tandem with the Fayette County Clerk's Office. It had been mislabeled. We thought it had been destroyed in a fire in the 1920s. But the bottom line is, it is on microfilm and it has uh, been scanned for uh, this website. We've got the database. Don't touch anything blue, Candy. And then uh, we've got frequently asked questions. Okay, so. Let's move ahead. <laughs> Even in the, oh, look at that. Okay, there it went again. Okay, now minimize again, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm a, a it, yeah, okay, here we go. I'm learning. All right, I, we're, <laughs> I love it when that happens. All right, now, Certificates of Settlement and Preemption Warrants in Kentucky. We're going to search for the name Logan. Let's see how many results we get on this database, okay? Okay. This, uh, I'm going to scroll down the page because there were a number of them, and I'm going to keep this little cursor over here in the white area. Does that sound like a good idea? Not a good idea. Probably a good idea. <laughs> All right. Nathaniel Logan, okay, sir, a settlement certificate was issued in his name for 400 acres. A preemption warrant was issued in his name for 1,000 acres. I can use the Gazetteer right here by clicking location watercourse, I will be taken immediately to the Gazetteer and it will tell me where St. Ace of Spring is, what county. Uh, okay, under preemption warrant, I have two choices, cropped image and original scanned image. 
And then I see in the authorized field, it tells me what patents were authorized by that certificate of settlement and preemption. This matches the information from that blue book, the master index that we talked about a few minutes ago. So I've got several options here to click. So I think the first one that we're going to do is the cropped image. Let's see if I can surf over here. Okay. Oh, look what we found. Two researchers in Kentucky visited the Library of Virginia and asked if there was anything there that they could look through that they hadn't seen before. <laughs> and the Library of Virginia brought out the uh, boxes with the certificates, the original documents. Uh, the Secretary of State's office uh, paid for the filming of these and then uh, libraries and archives scanned them for us. So we do hereby certify that Nathaniel Logan is entitled to 400 acres of land in the District of Kentucky on account of settlement made in the year 1776. Now, was that before January 1st, 1778? Yes, it was. It was, wasn't yes. it? All right. <laughs> so, would he have been entitled to a, 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 a crop of corn, a corn and cabin claim? He would have, wouldn't yes, he? Yes. Yeah. All right. Lying below the mouth of St. Asa Spring Branch on a creek about two and a half miles, and that the said Nathaniel Logan is entitled to the preemption of 1,000 acres of land adjoining the said settlement. Okay, so he is entitled to the 1,400 acres because he made a settlement. This particular certificate or warrant does not spell out the corn. Uh, you will see that on the bulk of them though, it will. Issued at St. Asaph's this October 20th, 1779, by the land commissioners, Fleming, Lyme, and Barber. Trig went along as the fourth one. So we now have an authorization for a 1,400-acre patent. It could be done in one survey or in two. It was done in two. All right. We're going to take a look at that Kentucky Doomsday Book. At the far right in the lower column, you see the word index. If I click any of those, we're going to be lost in the Doomsday Book forever. So <laughs> I would ask you to look over at the word index, then find the name Nathaniel Logan, and it will direct you to the right page. Here's the scanned uh, image of page one of the Doomsday Book, the Commissioner Certificate Book. This was the journal that was kept by those commissioners as the witnesses came in and applied for the Certificates of Settlement Preemption warrant authorizations or chop claims. Page one, the opening. It talks about how they've been sworn in for this office and they're ready to get to work. Now, the index told me that I needed to go to page 18 to see John Logan's entry. I backed up to page 16 to see where exactly uh, the commissioners were meeting when that uh, was uh, approved for Mr. Logan. And it said a court you know, held and so forth at St. Asaph's, and it gave the date, uh, October 1779. So, we now have, that's down at the bottom of the page, is the uh, statement of, uh, we are convening to hear uh, uh, claims. Captain John Logan, for and behalf of Nathaniel Logan, claimed the right to settlement and preemption to the tract of land, being near the mouth of St. Asaph's Spring Branch. Then you'll see, right after that, William Logan was also present that day. I don't know why Nathaniel wasn't there to do his own claim, but it was filed by Captain John Logan, and Nathaniel will be the uh, one who will receive the patent at the end of the day, uh, or later on. So we, this can be an interesting way uh, to have more information available. It is online, in your libraries, and there's no charge for any of this information. You do not have to be a member of the Secretary of State's land office website to be able to access this information. Your tax money paid for it. You need to be able to have access to it. Patent series over. Oh dear, we've got to hurry up and get that blue thing out of the way here, don't we? Uh, this is the page that tells you what records have been scanned and are available online, uh, either in whole or in part. The Virginia Patent Series and Old Kentucky Patent Series are going to be the very earliest land patent series that we have. All images are available. Secretary of State John Y. Brown III looked at the black and white images. He was not pleased with the fact that 
you could not see the red wax seals. So everything had to be redone uh, by using color scanners, flatbed scanners. The documents have been laminated or encapsulated for uh, uh, handling purposes, uh, but we do not feed them through rotary scanners. We use a flatbed scanner at 360 resolution. All documents pertaining to Virginia's and, uh, and Old Kentucky's are online. The West of Tennessee River military patents are online. They're also linked to the Revolutionary War Warrants database. The West of Tennessee River non-military patents are online, all of them. The County Court Order Series. Uh, the index is online with various search functions. Only a few thousand of the patents are actually available for viewing. This series you will still have to contact the Kentucky Land Office in order to see copies of the records, the warrants and the surveys and grants. The County Court Order Series is our largest series with over 70,000 land patents. The last patent was issued by Governor Steve Bashir. There are over 100,000 patents in total, dating back to the time we were part of Virginia. Oh, I have to watch my arrow, don't I? Okay. Now, <laughs> this is fun, actually. Virginia and Old Kentucky Patent Series. Caveats are online, unfinished patents, unused warrants, and we also have um, a page that links to selected patents, which might be helpful. For those of you who have students of Kentucky history visiting your libraries, what can they do to add to their Kentucky folders? Where, what other information is available, even if they're not into genealogy yet, but they're studying Kentucky history? What other information is available? Okay, Virginia and Old Kentucky Patent Series. We're going to open that up, and right now, since we know the patent numbers from that Certificate of Settlement uh, website, or we've accessed the Virginia patent series, uh, or the Virginia Master Index, we can sort by patent. And we're going to be looking for those numbers that we saw on the Certificates of Settlement pages. And by the way, we could have clicked there and opened up the images as well. There we see the scanned images of the warrant. No, the warrant isn't available for this. It's the survey and the uh, front of the document, the back of the document, the land office copy of the survey, and then the last two pages are the land office copy of the grant. It was divided into two parts during scanning. So I can see all of the images for Virginia 0445.1 online in the Virginia and Old Kentucky Patent Series. We also have links to those two blue books that are the Index to Virginia and Old Kentucky Patents uh, furnished by uh, the Kentucky Historical Society if you do not have those books in your stacks. I have a feeling you do, though. Okay, That helps you get those patent numbers and double the names. Here is the enlarged image of Nathaniel Logan's 1,400-acre patent, 400 acres of settlement, 1,000 acres preemption. They are adjacent. William Montgomery was the assistant or deputy surveyor who surveyed this tract for James Thompson, the surveyor of Lincoln County. Earlier, we saw how big Lincoln, Fayette, and Jefferson counties were. They had to have deputies. Daniel Boone was a deputy in both Lincoln and Fayette. I mean, there are a lot of people there that were working uh, out of that surveyor's office because there was no way that one man could cover a third of the state and get the surveys done that needed to be done. There was too much going on here. Right now, I can also you oh here we go. Okay, I can sort by name and description if I want to uh, find that 500 acre tract. I'll do it this way. I don't have to do by patent number. I can do by name and description. If I don't know a patent number, this is the way to do that. If I'm researching a person and I don't have access to Jillson's or the Master Index, I can just sort search by name. In this case, I find a Nathaniel Logan uh, received patent number 6123 in the Virginia series. And I have a variety of records here. I have the front of the warrant, the back of the warrant, I have the survey, I have the back of the survey, and I have two larger documents, and then two more documents, and then I pick up on the grant. 
our IT staff has given you uh, the uh, the warrants. Oh, well, all documents are available in low, medium, or high res. You know, so you can pick that out. If you, for example, if you just wanted to uh, save the warrant as a JPEG or a TIFF file, you could do that. Or if you just wanted to print that out, that's fine. But let's see here what that 500 acre patent was authorized by. Warrant number 62624. Uh, I would have said it would have been a treasury warrant claim. Totally wrong until I actually looked at the warrant. John Smith, his heirs or his signs, the quantity of 1,000 acres. Okay, we know Nathaniel's only going to use 500 or as an assignee. Due unto the said John Smith for military service performed by him as a captain during the late war between Great Britain and France. This is a French and Indian War warrant that was used by Nathaniel Logan to patent 500 acres of land. I would flip that document over on the back to see if there were more assignments other than to Nathaniel Logan. Instead, I see a separate assignment. I do assign over on my right and title of 500 acres of a survey, part of the above warrant, made in the name of John Smith, lying on a branch. So the warrant was issued to Smith for service in the French and Indian War. It was surveyed for John Smith. Then Smith assigned it over to Nathaniel Logan, as we see down here. And I do not know what's going to happen to these documents if they take cursive writing out of school. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I do assign all my right and title to a tract of 500 acres on Falling Timber Branch, adjoining the settlement and preemption of Forbes. And he assigned this tract over to Logan. Smith is now finished with that 500 acres. It's no longer his. Nathaniel Logan. It was signed by by James Smith, heir of John Smith, the assignment was witnessed by Benjamin Logan. Once again, we can use the date here of the assignment, February 1786, to determine that uh, for some reason uh, John is not able to sign because it was signed by James Smith, his heir. I want to uh, uh, interject a point that we just found uh, a few months ago because we had questions about these Revolutionary War soldiers who were not able to attend the commissioners meetings but they had qualified for the corn and cabin claims they just weren't there to get the blessing of the commissioners an act was passed in October 1779 that gave those officers and soldiers more time to apply for their corn and cabin claims and the statement is made on this one. Joseph Lindsay, agent for John Williams, is entitled to the settlement of 400 acres of land on the East Fork of Licking, adjoining William May's settlement and preemption. And then it goes down uh, because he had been raising corn at Harrodsburg before the year 1778. Mm -hmm. So there was a special allowance made for those soldiers who were not present uh, during the commissioner's hearings because they, in fact, were attending, uh, they were serving their country back home. So then he spent that one. Now, he could not have used a Revolutionary War uh, warrant to patent land on the East Fork of Licking, but this soldier is going to use a Certificate of Settlement Preemption Warrant authorization to do the patent. Sample patents. And this is the page that I think some of your students studying Kentucky history or even uh, uh, not necessarily the younger students might enjoy seeing. We have uh, added uh, patents that we think will be of interest to people studying uh, history. We've got a survey by Daniel Boone. And if you don't mind, I will not click over there because we will be running all over the place. But we have um, uh, patents uh, for Pikeville. Uh, one of several claims in the area by Reverend James Madison. Affidavits regarding Ruddle Station. We studied that in Kentucky history classes years ago. Signature of John Filson. A signature of Simon Kenton. And a survey uh, by John Bradford. All of these uh, we think would be interesting 
to add a plat drawing, including Simon Kenton's cabin. Um, and you can run that uh, survey forward through the deeds to confirm the location. Um, this is handy for historical preservation purposes. Let's see one of those. Uh, here you go. Ruddle Station, they couldn't finish up their uh, patents because they were captive. And this is the affidavit of Captain John Bird, who uh, is uh, uh, following through on patents because they, you know, and he, he gives information about uh, being taken hostage. They were not penalized because they were not here to finish those patents because they were captive. The law allowed them to proceed. And those affidavits are very interesting uh, to just even read passively. Lincoln County entries. Okay, we have seen the uh, certificate of settlement and preemption warrant claim uh, filed by Nathaniel Logan. How that did in fact go to patent. Uh, we've uh, uh, we've seen the entry in the Doomsday Book. We've seen the commissioner certificate. But what about that second step, the entry? If we get on the Lincoln County entries website, we will uh, find. A copy of the entry, Nathaniel Logan enters a preemption warrant of a thousand acres adjoining a settlement on the southeast. Gilson did another book called Old Kentucky Entries and Deeds. You will have it in your libraries, I'm certain of that, but it can be one of the most confusing to the researchers. People will look at these entries and consider them to be patents. They were not. This is just a listing of people who filed step two in the patenting process. You will see marginal notations, or we'll see notations withdrawn, withdrawn, surveyed. You might see amended. But the book Old Kentucky Entries and Deeds is not to be construed as a listing of people who took title. It's just they participated in the patenting process. This is step two. Also in that book, you will see the listing of military warrants issued to Revolutionary War soldiers, the warrant numbers, the date the warrant was issued. You will see the military entries listing, and you will see the Court of Appeals index, uh, grantors and grantees. It's a valuable book, but we've got to understand an entry is not a title document. It's just part two, step two in the process. What about those Revolutionary War soldiers? Another book that I like in my uh, repository or my library is Revolutionary Soldiers in Kentucky compiled by Anderson C. Quisenberry. Um, in it, he lists the veterans, where they were residing when they received their pensions, and their type of service. Most valuable to me is the state from which they served. Now we've already talked about the fact that a Maryland soldier could not use a bounty land warrant within Lincoln County to patent land. He wasn't a Virginia soldier. We have also seen that a Virginia survey, a Virginia soldier could patent land in Kentucky, but he could not patent it in, use it to patent in Lincoln County. Those Virginia warrants had to be used in the military districts established by Virginia in southwestern Kentucky or in Ohio. A North Carolina veteran would have had to use his warrant someplace else. None of these pensioners obtained their land in Lincoln County by using a Revolutionary War warrant. One more time. None of these soldiers could patent land in Kentucky under the authorization of a Revolutionary War warrant. They could cash their pension checks, yes, in Lincoln County. They could use other types of warrants to patent land in Lincoln County. They could even purchase land in Lincoln County. Or they could homestead in Lincoln County. They just couldn't spend that Revolutionary War warrant outside of the designated military districts. Does that make sense, Charlie? Mm -hmm. She's nodding. I've still got her here. <laughs> okay, that's fine. All right, let's move ahead. The subject of our search is going to be James Durham, 
a private in the Virginia line. I'm going to open up the Virginia Registers and Land Records website. Once again, this is a free service uh, uh, sponsored by the Secretary of State's office. Okay, and I will see links to various articles about the Revolutionary War District and uh, the West of Tennessee River military patents uh, and the establishment of the land office. We've got several things on there for your information. But I'm going to go to the Revolutionary War Warrants database. And again, they're embedded some more articles. But let's suppose that I haven't had access to Jilson's Old Kentucky Entries and Deeds, so I don't know a specific warrant number. I do have to know that the number's got to be less than 4,746. If it's higher than that, it's not going to be on the website. How do I know that? This paragraph right here. We have 4,746 warrants indexed. Due to duplication numbers, there is uh, 4,627. It's going to be your highest number. That's where the number is going to stop. If a Revolutionary War uh, veteran received bounty warrant number 5,203 from Virginia for his Revolutionary War service, it's not going to be in the Kentucky Military District or on this database. You will have to research the uh, Bureau of Land Management website or contact Ohio. I do not have to fill out a warrant number box. I do not have to put an assignee. I'm going to do my search for Durham. It's going to lead me to this page. I'm going to see warrant number 1846.1 was issued to James Durham, 100 acres, three years of service, Virginia Continental Line. The warrant date was October 10, 1783. Authorized Old Kentucky Patent Number 7246. If there's an asterisk beside that, that tells me the veteran's warrant is part of the file. The document that is here is a scanned image from the warrants register. I can click the link and I can see a close-up of that once again. It says to the principal surveyor of the land set apart for the officers and soldiers of Commonwealth of Virginia, not Lincoln County or 1406 Elizabeth Street, this shall be your warrant to survey and lay off in one or more surveys for James Durham, 100 acres. No specific tract is identified, only the location of where the tract would be selected. And that is in the land set apart for officers and soldiers, warrant number 1846. We have several options for you here. You can put your cursor inside here and save that as a JPEG or a TIFF. Or you can download the entire image for even better quality. Okay. I'm going to give you some printing tips here too. Here we go. We've got the image here that we can uh, save uh, or uh, print out from here if we li would like to do that. I can also, uh, if I'm getting ready to print this, anytime you print a TIFF file, be sure you uncheck this box. If you do not, part of the document will be cut off on the sides. I'm going to print this out in letter. I'm going to use a color printer, but I'm going to make sure this box is not clicked. Whether you're using newspaper TIFFs, whatever, I, I wish it would default to be unchecked, but it doesn't. But the bottom line is you will cut off documents if you do not uncheck that box. Then I'm ready to hit print. Okay. In this case, I have opened up Old Kentucky Patent Series. I've gone by patent number because I know now I could have linked from the website, but I'm wanting you to see how these different pages do present themselves. This is particularly helpful if somebody used 30 treasury warrants and you don't want to print them all out, you just want to print the survey. If you have all the documents in front of you, you can be able to pick and choose the ones that you want to print. So I see the uh, front of the warrant, the back of the warrant, and then I see the survey, the back of the survey, then I see another document, and then I see the land office copy of the grant. Here's your military warrant, James Durham. This is uh, 
uh, the one that went to Mr. Durham, and he's going to end up using it to uh, file an entry with the county surveyor for the military district. But uh, the other document is from the warrants register. As we said earlier, when you see the asterisk beside a patent number, that is the document that we're talking about, is the veteran's warrant is available. Here is the survey. We're going to go through these terms again. Survey for James Durham, 100 acres of land on a military warrant. He couldn't get any, you know, it's not going to be 1,000 acres or 500 acres. It's limited to the amount of land that uh, Virginia was paying him for his service. Okay, uh, and then we've got uh, on an entry made, this is what we're going, okay, uh, on the waters of Gaspers River, beginning at, and then we have the meets and bounds description, and then Mr. Hollis and Mr. Talbert are the CCs. What does that CC stand for? Chain carrier. William Ewing is the M marker. He's blazing the trees. And then we've got Burwell Jackson as the deputy surveyor. And uh, the date of the survey is 1797. This document was examined and recorded in 1798 by Richard Anderson, who was the surveyor, one of the surveyors for the military district. And he's making a statement that he doesn't have any other uh, patents around him. Another point about these names here, sometimes you can see, uh, for example, James Durham Sr., you might see James Durham uh, Jr. here. What's interesting about these names is they're not having uh, the survey made for themselves. They're not going to be the patentees in this process. They may not have even been involved in the warrants. But their feet are on the ground that day on a tract of land lying close to Gaspers River, we're establishing residency. It's rather hard to do a survey when you're in Baltimore, Maryland. <laughs> right, so this gives you an idea. They're on, feet on the ground. I used the Gazetteer to identify Gasper River, Warren County. And I want to thank my friends in Warren County because I called them to find out if I'm supposed to pronounce that Gasper River or Jasper River, and they were very kind to tell me how to pronounce that. All right, now, I would look on the back of that document to see if there are any more assignments. I would like to point out the online resources page for you on the Secretary of State's website. We have articles that were written uh, by various people. We've got a listing of early Kentucky surveyors done by Bud Salyer, who was uh, uh, the uh, attorney for the Kentucky Association for professional surveyors and the Board of Licensure. And uh, he has identified the names of early surveyors and made a table for you. We also have articles about uh, Kentucky tax lists, and we have several articles by Ron Bryant about Kentucky history. On the history page, we have uh, the biographies of the secretaries of state over the years. We also have keyed in the text of all of Kentucky's constitutions. Um, the, uh, they're searchable. So if you wanted to find out something about uh, Secretary of State or Land Office, you could use that uh, text of the Constitutions to be able to find out the changes in the office over the years. Uh, geographic materials, those are maps, including the Lockridge map we're going to see in a few minutes that has to be printed uh, on engineering uh, uh, printers, but the bottom line is the information is available for you. A glossary of terms today. Uh, Charlie, when we were setting this website up, I was working with a, I think he was 20 years old at the time, <laughs> and he said, Candy, you have been using a lot of words that, quite honestly, I don't know what they are. And he said, may I suggest that you generate a glossary for this website? Awesome. So we want to thank Jesh Cottle for his forward thinking, <laughs> because not only did he do all of the program <laughs> programming for this uh, laid off his website, he also suggested the glossary. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Jesh. All right. Legislation. This is uh, a link to the legislation pertaining to all of the uh, 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 General Assembly Acts uh, regarding uh, seminaries, uh, the Poor Persons Act, the Poor Widows Act, uh, for the various patent series. Bibliography of resources suggested uh, for you for your library. And then also links. Now remember that one because we're going to use that in just a moment. This is a sample page from the legislation. 
uh, a listing of the acts of General Assembly that are available for you to study, uh, our historians, so you can see the actual wording of that proclamation of 1763 uh, to see what the king was doing when he was uh, setting up that proclamation line and so forth. Now, one of the resources that you may or may not have in your uh, holdings, it was, I didn't have it until just a few years ago, is the Index of Revolutionary War Pension Applications in the National Archives. Here's the ISBN number. We have established that a George Durham from Virginia uh, was receiving a pension in Lincoln County because we accessed Quisenberry's book, right? Mm -hmm. But we didn't have a pension file number. Here we have a pension file number, which can be very helpful when there are uh, veterans with the same names. We know our man didn't serve from North Carolina. He served out of Virginia. So that narrows it down right there to this one here. I'm going to go to another free website. It's called revwarapps.org. Okay, I can now see a, the abstract of James Durham's pension file. And I have established here that uh, State of Kentucky, I, Thomas Montgomery, Circuit Courts, and the State of Forsyth do certify James Durham appeared before me in the county of Lincoln. So I now have matched that pensioner from Lincoln County with his pension abstract. And they're doing marvelous work. They keep adding more and more of these abstracts to the website. And they are scanning the signatures. This can be helpful, even if a veteran assigned his warrant to someone else. You see on the back, you see a signature. You can take a signature and map the, uh, match that to a marriage bond and uh, determine if that was indeed the same person. We've had uh, at least one person uh, be able to uh, be eligible for the Sons of American Revolution because his ancestor did not keep his revolutionary warrant. He sold it, and the signature matched a marriage bond for one of the children. So they were able to accept that. On page two, he identifies his residence as Mercer County. Uh, in his pension abstract. So we know that Mr. Durham did not stay in Lincoln County. He moved to Mercer County. Moving to tax lists. We've talked about a lot of different ways uh, to patent land, the types of warrants. How can tax lists work in tandem with the land patent process? In 1801, I don't have to worry about links on this one, Charlie. We're not going to be jumping around. Okay. <laughs> In 1801, we see the Lincoln County tax lists. And down at the bottom, we find a David Logan and a John Logan were paying taxes on second-rate acreage in Lincoln County on Logan's Creek. Now, let's get this part done. On our website, under online resources, we have an article about researching Kentucky tax lists. According to the General Assembly of Kentucky, land was graded for tax purposes. First rate land was similar to bluegrass land, flat, tillable, um, desired you know, farmland. Okay, it's going to have a higher tax rate. Second rate land is going to be gently rolling. It might be harder to till or to farm. Third rate land is going to be hilly, rocky. It's not going to be the best land. So people did not pay the same amount of taxes for third rate land as they did for first rate land. That is what the grading system was all about. And if the tax commissioner did not get the grading correct, he was financially responsible. So it was incumbent upon him to make sure he graded it correctly. Now let's look at this Lincoln County tax list. We see Lincoln County, Lincoln County, Lincoln County, but we also see that Jonathan here is paying taxes on land he owned in Pulaski County as well. You paid taxes for lands that you own throughout the state. You paid those taxes from your home county. 
We also know that women pay taxes. Mary Langford is paying taxes on property. Apparently she's the head of the house in 1801. She's not going to be able to vote for 120 years, but the bottom line is she is paying taxes. Free blacks are on the tax lists decades before the Civil War. The tax list columns are uh, even better than a decennial census. You can follow these people through every year. All right, now, the rest of the columns. We've got uh, the county in which the land is located. This gentleman's paying on Shelby County lands that he owned as well. All right, in whose name entered, in whose name surveyed, in whose name patented. So for Nathaniel Logan, we know that Nathaniel Logan entered that thousand acre preemption warrant. We just saw it a few months ago, a few minutes ago. Months ago, it probably seems like it to these <laughs> dear kind, uh, kind listeners. But he entered it. He used the warrants that he had. He also had the land surveyed. It's in whose name surveyed. It's not the name of the person who did the actual survey. It's for whom the survey was being conducted. And then whose name patented or granted. Same. So I'm looking for that 1,400 acre patent that David and John are paying taxes on, aren't I? That's how it's going to trace back. I could not find Nathaniel Logan listed in Lincoln County. This suggests that either he had moved along and David and John were paying taxes on the property or he was deceased. But I would start looking at records prior to 1801 to see if I can find something about Nathaniel. The wording on the grant issued by the governor states that the land conveys to the patentee and his heirs. So you may not find a deed by which that patent is conveyed to the children or the spouse because they have the right to that property based on the wording of the grant. The government was telling people that the land didn't revert back to the Commonwealth for repatenting when they put that there. But there was no deed recorded. You know, people just used the wording, you know, to the patentee and the heirs. In Eastern Kentucky, I've been told that uh, the good people there will take their land grants that have descended down through their families over through the years, and they will take that grant and fold it over right, it goes to so-and-so, or makes a good base, and then they will store that in their Bibles. So this is going to establish title. Even though a deed wasn't recorded, you do have to make sure the taxes are paid. Otherwise, it will be exposed to sale. Other columns may change. I've got two white males, over 21, uh, listed by David as being in the household. And then I've got five horses. Fellas, you had to report your billiard tables for tax purposes. This is uh, These tax lists, even though I couldn't find Nathaniel, I looked through the tax list until I find someone who was paying taxes on part of that patent. I knew I would find it. Uh, so when David and John would get ready to sell their properties, that deed would say, being inherited by uh, uh, or being conveyed to me by patent, you know, by my father, you know, I know I'm going to get more information on this. Now, James Durham, I found him on 1817 tax lists, James Durham. He's paying taxes on 100 acres of third rate land, and now we have a county identified, Warren County. Gasper. He is the one that entered, surveyed, and patented it, even though they put dental marks there, and that can be kind of confusing on whether they mean this man or somebody above, but we know that he did have that 100-acre military tract that he had not sold prior to 1817 because he is identifying it as part of his land ownership for tax purposes. He himself does not have any land. So he apparently he is uh, homesteading or you know something like that, uh, uh, renting, leasing. That was done back then too. You didn't necessarily have to own property back then 
um, just as you don't have to own property today. So we identify the properties that we owned, Lincoln County, Lincoln County, bullet, bullet, that's what Mr. Davis is doing, the people that patented the property. And uh, women were on the tax lists and uh, free blacks. You will see in whose company or whose company on some of the tax lists and what that was. The taxpayers uh, rode to their local militia company to pay their taxes. The law, had to, the law said that uh, the taxpayers did not have to participate in muster. Um, but this was a good way for the militia company to know what uh, men were of el eligible age in case they needed them, if they had horses, if they had guns, what have you. But it does not mean that the taxpayer was actually a member of the militia company. The law just required the tax assessor to identify the name of the captain who received the tax payment. That was to protect the taxpayer as well. You know, I paid my taxes to Captain McAfee. All right, it's in this company. That's, you know, I paid, or somebody that was in his group. So the tax lists from about the uh, 1810 or so to the early 1830s identified that. After um, about 1835, the Kentucky tax list dropped the identification of the patent information, unfortunately. Because that was very helpful in uh, determining the location of that property. You may not have been able to tell it by deed, but if you plotted the patent, you might be able to know that he lived within this territory. So those are the values of the tax list. Just as they do today, the headers or the tax collection uh, requirements changed. Every year you're going to have changes. You're going to have the person chargeable with the tax, whether it's white, uh, male, uh, female, or free black, the type of land for grading purposes, the water course, and the patent information, and other information including your billiard tables reported for tax purposes, wheel carriages, and uh, even your uh, uh, total value except stud horses and jacks. You even had to pay taxes on the rate of covering. We're in Kentucky, so we all know what that means. All right, 1875, tax lists, the taxpayers, the tracts, the election precinct number. Look now at how many uh, fields have been added. They had to report the value of their gold, silver, and other metallic watches and clocks, and their gold and silver plate, and their pianos. Charlie, this is a good way to learn the demographics of your county. Mm -hmm. You can find out who had the carriages, who had the stores, who were the owners of the city lots or the town lots? Um, and the numbers uh, were sometimes reported in a separate table of the demographics at the end of the tax lists. Uh, the number of uh, sheep, the number of sheep killed by dogs, uh, the white persons that are blind and their post office. A lot of information about the county and about the residents. Now those tax lists um, are on microfilm here at the Kentucky Department for Libraries and Archives, the Kentucky History Center. Over the years, we have encouraged our counties to, uh, in which we have given talks, to acquire rolls of microfilm of tax lists. There will be several rolls, starting from the year of county formation and then running up until the 1880s. Uh, so, you know, prior to the formation of the county, you would look in the mother county to find that person. We have literally watched people move uh, when somebody said, well, the census indicates they were in Bullock County, but I can't find them beforehand. We've been able to determine what year that person, uh, uh, you know, got to Bullock County by studying Shelby County tax list, for example. We follow them through. Uh, with the tax list, you can literally sing happy birthday to a young male who turns uh, 18 uh, because the columns are number of white males in the over 21 and then number of white males between 18 and 21. If he's not on the list the year before and then all of a sudden you have one showing up as 18, you might have a birthday that just happened. Tax lists are uh, very useful for determining seniors and juniors. We've had that happen before. Uh, that We didn't realize uh, that there was a man of the same name so I might uh, need to research two people instead of one now. You know, maybe a father and son or younger. Can you get that microphone from UK is the question? Or is it? Okay. 
do you get the microfilm from UK? Uh, thank you for the glossary. I'll see the judge hears about that. Uh, the um, right now, I think tax lists are being added to the Family Search website. I have not used that one, but I've been advised that they are putting those online. Um, Charlie, confirm with me that the Kentucky Department for Libraries and Archives no longer duplicates microfilm of tax lists. I believe that had to stop uh, about a year or so ago. I couldn't speak to that. Right. I'm not, I, some of our uh, reference librarians are typing in. So. They are on Family Search. Thank you. I don't know if they have them all yet uh, or are adding them as quickly as they can. Uh, the Church of Latter-day Saints were, uh, was the entity that filmed these first. So they would have the negatives in their holdings. I think some were filmed by KDLA later on. But well, however we can get these online and get these in the hands of our researchers, that's what we want. Mm -hmm. And we encourage everybody to do that. Uh, yes, uh, tax lists uh, on microfilm at KDLA could be scanned. Okay. Planting seeds, everyone. That's what I'm doing today. I'm planting <laughs> seeds. <laughs> Might be a good thing to see. Okay. Uh, tax lists are available on film if your local library or historical society uh, did not purchase them before. Uh, they are available in roll format, History Center, KDLA, and LDS libraries. Um, you will find information about the land patents. Uh, they span from the year of county formation in the mid-1880s. Study the acts to determine the tax laws. Women and free blacks, as we said before, and pensioners are included on the tax list. Um, the pensioners who resided in Pulaski County and they had served in the Revolutionary War were paying taxes on their horses and billiard tables. That's a third of the state. That was a lot of tax revenue to waive. So, yes, they were liable for taxation. Tax list may include two or three districts. You'll get in the notion of watching the handwriting, actually. Um, in Mercer County, uh, my home county, uh, I've identified it as East 127, West 127, and then Southern uh, 127 that became Boyle County. Uh, so you're going to have the districts, and then those names will start uh, you know, ringing a bell when you go through there. The handwriting will uh, become familiar. The company header refers to the name of the militia company uh, captain. Miners are on the tax list. In fact, they'll make a notation of like Travis Atkinson, minor. He's the head of the house. Now, if he's an infant, if they're infant heirs, there will be an executor, administrator, and a court appointed attorney to make sure the taxes are paid on behalf of the children who are under age. Okay, but they are a, very much an annual census with even more information. Hiding from the tax man had severe penalties. There is no master patent map that shows the location of any of the 100,000 patents that we have in our holdings. That type of mapping has to be done by the researcher. There have been some local historians that have used patents to plot particular areas. Um, or even uh, identify the patents within their counties. Check with your local historical society or local historian to see if such thing has been done for your county. What you would do if you wanted to consider doing this, run your chain of title back to patent. Okay? You take those deeds at the courthouse and eventually you're going to see being a part of an original patent issued to Nathaniel Logan. And we've shown you where to find that patent today in this talk. Okay? Use traditional methods of plotting or acquire some software to do that. Visit the site, walk the land, find a cemetery, and enjoy the view that your ancestors saw years before. And for Pete's sakes, donate a copy of your map to the local mm -hmm. historic site for future researchers. If I may interject a little story here. A few years ago, I received a call from uh, uh, Camp Lejeune, uh, Retired Marine was wanting to know where his ancestor was buried in Kentucky. Now that may sound like an impossible task, but what we did was we accessed together the tax lists for the county uh, in which he last resided, and it turned out to be Miss Madison County. I happened to have that roll of microfilm. And I found his name. I said, do you know what year he died uh, when he passed away? 
and he gave me a, an approximate year on where he thought it was. He just really wanted to know where he was buried. Well, he had died before church cemeteries were established as well as they were, you know, and so forth. So we, we were dealing pretty early in the 1800s. So we looked on the tax lists, and we found the name of his ancestor paying taxes on land that he himself had filed an entry on, had surveyed, and had been granted. And uh, so I really got lucky because I looked in Jilson's and I found a patent by that name in Madison County and it was a smaller tract. We're not talking about three or four thousand acres. So I sent him the patent and I suggested perhaps he plot that out on a topographical map and he would at least see the approximate location of where his ancestor did uh, live and possibly die. So he uh, called me and he said, I've got it plotted. It's on a horseshoe bend of the Kentucky River in Madison County. And my daddy and I, a, a retired Marine colonel, are going to be traveling to Kentucky to go see that land. I thought, well, this is wonderful. So they, in fact, did uh, travel to uh, Madison County. Uh, he called me back about this. And he, he knew the approximate location of the property. And he, so he went to a little country store nearby. And as Kentuckians do, we make everyone feel welcome. He went into the grocery store. And he says, does anybody know where this particular tract of land is? I've got it plotted out here. My ancestor owned this by patent. And there was a gentleman in the grocery store that said, that's my farm. So with that being said, uh, the farmer said, would you like to see the land? And so they drove out from that country store and went to the land. And uh, the retired Marine officers stayed in the car because there was a thicket of trees that the farmer said there may be something in that thicket of trees that uh, I don't know, I've never really looked, but I'll go look. The two Marines decided to stay in the car, Charlie, because they were afraid there were going to be snakes in that thicket. <laughs> <laughs> they were probably right. No but the bottom line is uh, the farmer went into the thicket of trees, then motioned them forward and said, come here, and mm -hmm. called out to them. They went and they started turning over the rocks, and there was the tombstone of his ancestor with the... Uh, the name down into the ground, so it hadn't been damaged. It was ready to be found if only an effort was to be made. And the uh, gentleman who did the research used tax lists, land patents, plotted it out, then came to Kentucky to see where his ancestor resided. Even if that cemetery hadn't been there, he would have been able to walk that land. This is a sample patent map that was done by Robert Humphreys, and uh, a book that he uh, published, Early Landowners in Madison County, Kentucky. Uh, we have acquired his permission to use this as a sample of what can be done. This is Richmond. Okay, You will see patents plotted, their approximate locations. There will be shingling that will happen, overlapping claims. That is normal. Uh, the more patents that you plot, the more uh, shingling you're going to find. The shingling is what results in the court cases, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, who has the right to it? The junior patentee, the senior patentee, you know, how do we do this? So I think this is going to be one of those 1,400 acre claims, I think. So this can be done. Quick guide to the Virginia series, um, and Old Kentucky series, South of Green River, the definition, the types of warrants. South and Green River were age and residency. This is what opened that former military district in southwestern Kentucky to settlers. It reached a point where people wanted to acquire land and they weren't Revolutionary War veterans. Teleco series, that's that Cherokee land uh, up until 1805. Kentucky land warrant series, there were three different types of uh, patent series being issued at one time and it was getting horribly confusing for the land office. You had the old Kentucky, South of Green River, and Teleco and they were assigning them to the wrong series. So and finally, in 1815, the land office said, we need some help here. General Assembly, give it to us. OK, they'll just purchase warrants from the land office and then proceed with the patenting process. South of Walker's Line, Tennessee, West of Tennessee River, military, non-militaries, and then the county court order database. OK. What is online at this time? The Virginia and Old Kentucky series, the West of Tennessee River Military, 
non-military Jackson Purchase Locator County Court Order Database. There should be what is not online on there. Okay, well, okay. Here's the West of Tennessee River non-military. I know I had that slide coming up. This is the series that is mapped by ranges, townships, and sections. It was sold at public auction. It got down to a nickel an acre, 160 acre quarter sections. I did a search for Rupert on this, and I found there was one result. This is going to be in the purchase area, far western Kentucky. The patent number, I can link to the images, and I see that he paid $40 for the 160 acres in that quarter section. The things that I wrote down were southwest quarter section, okay, 18, township 1, range 1, east or west. The grantee was John Rupert. The person who bought uh, the right to proceed with the patent, in this case, uh, this was sold at public auction or public sale. So they, they didn't need a warrant. They just bought the right to proceed with the survey in the actual grant. So we see that Clifton bought it, uh, bought the warrant, but then he assigned it over to John Rupert, who ended up being the patentee. Okay, here is the receipt issued by the receiver's office to Samuel Clifton saying you paid the fees, $40, for the 160 acres, 1829. I flip this over or advance to the next image, and I see that Samuel Clifton assigned this over to Rupert. Mr. Clifton's interest in this 160 acres is now gone. It's now Mr. Rupert's to proceed. Thomas Metcalf issued the land patent to John Rupert based on that certificate or that receipt that had been purchased by the other gentleman. Title is now Mr. Rupert's. He will be the one to sell it or bequeath it off to his heirs. This is the land office copy of the grant. Now this is the only series where we can show you the location of the land. It linked to that website that we were at a couple of frames ago. We have identified on the Lockridge map every range township section as well as the text, and we see that Mr. Rupert's land was going to be in Graves County, and uh, Feliciano, Pilot Oak, Water Valley are just some of the places that are included in this township. I click, and there it is, plotted out for you. There is a, a, a table below this box that helps you identify the section numbers. There are 36 sections in each township. Northwest, Northeast, Southwest, Southeast. We have determined that he got, according to the receipt, he's in that Southwest quarter section. This whole box is uh, 640 acres and he's got 160 acres. And we're tickled to see the Bureau of Land Management is doing this type of thing now, too. <laughs> yes, I talked to them <laughs> once at a seminar. I said, look what we're doing. Good. So you can see actually where they were living. And sometimes it's only a part of that 160 acres because, for example, right through here, you're not going to be able to take a whole full 160 acres. But here's your section key for each one of those boxes. And then they're divided up uh, into quarter sections. Suppose I want to know who his neighbors were. How difficult would that be in this type of mapping? Let's advance. I can go back and key in all of those coordinates, 1811 West, and I'll put it on a sortable grid, even though I could have done uh, uh, the listing with the documents, and I can see Mr. Patterson, Mr. Morris, Rupert, and uh, uh, Gray were the patentees within that section, 18 of Range 1, Township 1, West, in Graves County. Okay, that's the difference between the public uh, method of public land surveying method, where it's mapped out by ranges, townships, and sections, as opposed to the meets and bounds method of surveying used by Daniel Boone and our pioneers. On the county court orders, we've got advanced searches, 
uh, uh, database quick searches. Uh, usually our surveyors use that. But I've done the advanced search. I'm going to search by county. And uh, I'm going to uh, do 25 results. I can do 100 if I want. And now I, had, I did my search for Mercer County. And I see that even though Mercer County was one of the first counties settled, there were still 22 land patents issued from 1835 to current date that identify themselves as being within Mercer County. Some will link to images, some not. In most cases, you're going to need to contact the Kentucky Land Office for copies of these records, and we're glad to accommodate uh, you with those. So this is how this works. This, we've gone from the oldest, the French and Indian War claims, up until the newest, the County Court Order series of uh, land warrants purchased from, again, we say the system is still active. Steve Bashir issued the most recent land grant. And no, I don't know whether it's vacant and unappropriated land. Okay, what is not online at this time, out of all those nine series, we don't have the South of Green Rivers online. We don't have the Kentucky land warrants online. The telecos, I hope to have those on. I've been saying that for a couple of years, but they are scanned and they are indexed. Hopefully we can get those on soon. Um, South of Walker's Line are not online. We don't have the Fayette entry books online, nor uh, the Jefferson entry books or the military district things. These are all records that uh, may be on microfilm at your various libraries or here at uh, KDLA, or you can contact the Kentucky Secretary of State's land office, and we will be glad to work with you on those and provide the copies that you need. Other Kentucky records. And this is... Uh, Land patents are not the only records pertaining to Kentucky land. Let's make that clear. But land patents are the first place to look to rule them out before we go in through all of the other records. Deeds. Check out patents first to see if the land was acquired by patent. If you run out of luck on that, use uh, the tax list to identify the patentee to help you with the location but you're going to be going through the deeds. Uh, grant or grantee, establish your chain of title, see how that patent came to be. Uh, there is no central registration of deeds in Kentucky, but please remember your formation dates. Start with your present owners and work backward through the county records to identify past owners to establish this. All right. Then the other way is you can start with your patent and move it forward through the deeds to complete that end of the chain. It can be done. It does take time, but people who have done this have a better understanding about land appropriation, and they might find a different set of names and then realize, oh, that was the daughter who married this fella, you know. The, uh, so, you know, you can get a family connection that way. Commissioner's deeds. And unfortunately, uh, county clerks may have those indexed under C instead of the name of the person who owned the land that was losing it because of taxes or forfeitures or so forth. It might be indexed in the county clerk records under C, under commissioner's deeds. In fact, there may even be a separate set of books known as commissioner's deeds. Processioner's deeds. Daddy owned a thousand acres. He died without a will. How is the land going to be divided among his five children? The court will appoint processioners to make that division. The processioners book may record a copy of the survey and the division of the property uh, among uh, the heirs, the, the widow and the, and the children and so forth, and they are free to buy um, and trade the land among themselves. The processioners are supposed to be neutral parties. The processioners deeds may be separate books or they may be housed in the same deed books as the regular conveyance is done day by day. The county clerk can tell you uh, how that's done for that particular county. Wills can bequeath property, so there's no deed that's filed. So you need to check the will to see uh, you know, if there's any mention of property being conveyed. And we've talked about the land patents automatically descend to the heirs if the property has not been sold already. It doesn't revert back to the heirs if the property has been sold. Okay. 
key points. Kentucky is a state land state. We are not part of the federal public domain. That's why I'm with you today. Kentucky has a land office. We're not controlled by the Bureau of Land Management. We do have federal lands within our borders. They were ceded by uh, the Kentucky General Assembly, either prior to the Umbrella Act or after. But the bottom line is, Kentucky does own land in federal, uh, uh, federal government does own land within our borders, but the bottom line, it's up to Kentucky to decide how our land will be appropriated overall. Warrants do not identify a particular tract or location of a tract. They just allow you to proceed with the second step, the filing the entry. Every step has to be filed, followed closely. Um, up and get this governor's grant, that's the one that finalizes the patenting transaction. Some people call that the patent deed. Military grants are a small part of our holdings. We have the French and Indian War warrants, Lord Dunmore War warrants, and uh, uh, revolutionary, but we do not have any warrants for service in the War of 1812. Kentucky sent a lot of soldiers off to fight in the War of 1812. You were paid 160 acres of land if you served a week. But they could not spend that bounty land warrant within the Commonwealth of Kentucky. They had to use a public domain state. How do you research a War of 1812 soldier? You go to online resources and you click links. That will automatically take you to the search page for the Bureau of Land Management website. The Adjutant General Report for the Soldiers in the War of 1812 from Kentucky indicated a man named Orson Tribble served in the War of 1812. Okay. What can I find out about Orson or Austin Tribble, my, my War of 1812 ancestor? Yes, I can get military records and pensions, and I can find out about the company uh, in which he served, because the AG's report says it's uh, Simpson's company. But what about the land? All right, I'm going to get on this website. Now, this takes you directly to the link for the searches. You do not have to go through the BLM website that has a lot of other nice uh, uh, features. This link will take you directly to the page. Okay, any state, last name, Tribble, and of course I'm going to try different spellings of the name. I'm going to turn off search patentees because I, don't, I want to restri restrict this search to military. Search warranties. Then I'm going to hit search. I get a number of, get two pages of results, but I see down here Orson Tribble, Orson Tribble, Orson Tribble, Orson Tribble, and it's identified as being used in Illinois. The land office that is going to issue the land patent is going to be in Champaign. Is this the same Orson Tribble who was in Simpson's company? during the War of 1812. I'm going to click the images. This is free. This is all on your computers in your library. I did it. I did it. I did it. I did it again, didn't I? Okay, this is fine. Okay. Well, just close that because they can't see that. Oh, they can't see that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, at any rate, I'm going to make sure I move my arrow back. Uh, at, let's get this out of there. <laughs> okay. I did it again. Okay. All right. All right. Now, I'm going to, we've got some live links is what we've got. Okay, <laughs> so now we've got, uh, I'm, Mary Harris is the person who's going to get the grant. Orson Tribble is the person who qualified for the warrant. I still don't see any information that confirms this is for War of 1812 service. I see my location down here in Illinois. Uh, this is where it's going to be, and I can even, you know, plot that out on a map or see the closest towns. But if I open up the patent image up at the top of the page, I will see the land grant 
that was issued by President Taft, because remember, this is a public domain state, Illinois, and it says that it's issued in favor of Orson Tribble, private in Captain Simpson's company, Kentucky Mounted Volunteers, and then what war do I see? War of 1812. So your Kentuckians fought in the War of 1812. They either had to move to a public domain state to spend their warrant, or they sold their warrant uh, to someone else who was willing to make the move or signed it over to someone else. Then they had the money to buy property in Kentucky or do whatever they wished. But the bottom line is the warrants could not be spent inside the Commonwealth. This is a federal public domain land patent issued by President Taft. It's not a grant inside Kentucky. It's in Illinois. There are books, uh, Kentuckians to Illinois, Missouri, Indiana, and Ohio, that give you a nice little rundown of uh, Kentuckians that relocated uh, and where you can find their biographies. But I dare say part of the migration out or the exodus out of Kentucky could have been because of the uh, uh, soldiers' uh, inability to spend their warrants in Kentucky. They had to relocate out of the state. That partially explains the movement out. Is Texas listed here? That's a question. Is Texas listed? Yeah. Uh, I think they do have some land patents on there. I know they do Oklahoma. I think Texas does have. You will just do your search uh, back on the, uh, good question. Uh, you would just limit your search uh, on uh, the online resources on that page. Uh, bear with me here. Uh, on the state, here. You would use uh, uh, use your uh, uh, state here, and and just enter in Texas. They have a drop box, so you can identify the boxes there. I did not know where this War of 1812 warrant would have been issued, so or spent rather. So I left it as any state, any county. Actually, I found where Sally Kelly, uh, a widow of a Revolutionary War soldier, who, and they had settled in Mercer County. She got a bounty land warrant in the 1850s, 1860s for his service in Virginia, and I think that warrant was in Montana. It's where they had to spend it. Hmm. So she didn't go, but you know some of the heirs could have sold it or she could have sold it herself. So this is a, a very good little website. There's no money to it. This is the, the fast link from the online resources page of the Secretary of State's land office page. We'll get you right there where you need to be. So... Good question, though. Okay, and I, when you are, uh, okay, the Kentucky Secretary of State's office is the repository for over 100,000 patent files. County formation must be considered. You do not have to go to Virginia to study any land transaction by patent prior to 1792. It's in, it's in the land office in Frankfurt. No central registration of deeds. If there's a courthouse fire, it is a disaster if those records haven't been microfilmed or preserved someplace else. The names are spelled phonetically. Let's not lock in that it has to be spelled one way and that's it. That will not work. Uh, tax lists can be indexed by given name rather than surname. One county uh, indexed their tax list. Um, they put all the Johns and then comma last name. <laughs> so uh, they, he figured it out the next year. He got that right. <laughs> But it was interesting for a while. So, at any rate, patents were issued to women as early as the 1700s. You did not have to be an officer in the Revolutionary War, uh, a male, in order to get a land patent. Let's throw that notion out the window. Patents were issued to women. Uh, patents were issued to uh, soldiers uh, uh, who were identified as private. Uh, it, you didn't have to be a high-ranking officer. African Americans patented land. Our land office holdings are limited to patents only. Not all of the series are online at this time. KDLA is the repository for county records such as wills and deeds and other information. You may find information about Kentucky land in court cases. I put this slide in here. There are certain areas that are close to uh, uh, the na uh, National Forests or, uh, uh, for example, and they do a lot of uh, record searches in court cases. I have also had good uh, luck with court cases here at KDLA for the division of uh, 
property among 61 freed slaves in the 1820s. Your mining offices, your forest services, natural resources and Department of Revenue. They have a GIS mapping office there too. I'm giving you a bibliography of resources that I have found and I should say this is not everything by any means but these are some of the ones that I have identified early on as being important to the function of the land office especially when it comes to land patenting. There's that box truck. I want to tell you again how much of a pleasure it's been here. We're going to field some questions now. I think Charlie's been uh, keying in and I, I, I hope this has been maybe your first step into land patenting or, or uh, the tax uh, lists, uh, but if you have gotten nothing more than out, out of this talk, then my contact information over here, let's work together. Let's work together uh, in order to make sure that we have an informed um, research base, uh, one that knows that the documents are available, uh, we can confirm or correct. Uh, the Secretary of State's website is free. You do not have to be a member or pay a fee. Um, it's as close as your internet. Uh, and let's encourage KDLA to keep up these great uh, county preservation projects. And also, I like this webinar because I think this is going to be helpful, not just today, but down in the future. Hopefully I haven't confused you too much. It's been a pleasure <laughs> <laughs> being here. Thank you so much, Candy, and, and we're going to, I think we've gotten to all the questions except Anne's. Let me just move through these finals. Okay, we've got a couple. Let me just get to the survey. We need to thank the Institute of Museum and Library Services for their sponsorship of this webinar, many of our services. And I just want to get our survey open in case um, people are getting ready to, to exit. Um, so let me, let me just kind of um, move this over a little bit. And I'm going to pop the survey open on your on your uh, screen, but you you can minimize it if it opens up in front of the the webinar screen. Just minimize that, and you can come right back. I saw a question about the Doomsday Book. Yes. Okay. Uh, in England, uh, one of the early kings recorded the la uh, the names of landowners in a book that the taxpayers, I guess, were the ones that affectionately uh, called the Doomsday Book. Um, but we have over time called uh, the commissioner certificate book Kentucky's Doomsday Book mm -hmm. uh, and that's where you will see that journal that was kept by the land commissioners when they came in in the, in the 1700s to determine who was qualified for certificates of settlement and preemption warrants database. If you open up the Doomsday Book uh, website on Kentucky Land Office I have included other information about that uh, that might find interesting. We try to put frequently asked questions, and that's a good question to ask. We try to put things that uh, have been asked before. We try to do ask and answered as much as we can uh, so that uh, others may uh, have the benefit of uh, previously asked questions. But it is really just the commissioner's journal and the recording of who was entitled to what. But it is known as Kentucky's Doomsday Book in uh, mimicking what England did with their list of landowners. Okay, and we had a question from Ann who would like to know what a head rights grant is. Head right, okay. That uh, we have uh, uh, a series, well actually some of the warrants are uh, called head rights in the South of Green River series. Uh, that's when they met age and residency requirements. The term head right it was usually used along the coast uh, when you had the early colonists uh, getting their land claims and then uh, land patents. In Kentucky, we use that to uh, be uh, a description of uh, a grant that was issued because they met uh, certain requirements. In 1795, the Kentucky General Assembly opened up that military district to persons who had uh, lived on the land that uh, they wanted for one year and that they were over the age of 21. And then in 1798 or so, they dropped that down to 18 years and a one year resident. You had to go before the commissioners in that county and prove that you were of age and you'd been on that land prior. That is the foundation of the South of Green River patent series, sometimes called the Headright Claims, because they met age and residency. 
but really we kind of think along those on uh, uh, the uh, Atlantic coast. We do have a few patents uh, involving Theodoric Bland, which are unique because they are uh, granted uh, to him for importing people. He was a ship's captain. That's what research indicates. And so he was allotted so much per head that he transported over. Um, I don't know if uh, this was a slave ship or if he was bringing colonists. That is not identified in his records that we have. But he acquired a, a vast tract around Owensboro uh, for his uh, uh, being uh, the owner of a ship or uh, ship's captain, if you will, whatever. But those are what's known as importation warrants uh, when they were bringing people over to the United States. He just used his in Kentucky. Okay. And uh, Mark has a question. If King George III set up the proclamation line, how were the states like Virginia able to reach the Mississippi? Reach to the Mississippi. We fought a war against him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, we let him have his moment. <laughs> Let's put it that way. But we had those treaties. Um, on the other side, on the western side, with the Native Americans, which were uh, uh, rather encouraging to folks that, well, we're, we're going to cross over the line uh, because we're going to fight the king anyway. And you had surveying companies here even long before the proclamation line was set uh, who were doing their work. And they knew there was land to be had here and they wanted it. That's exactly why the king issued that proclamation, was to remind them that he was in charge of land appropriation, and you're going to stay on this side, and we're going to lay, leave the other uh, side for the Native Americans. But uh, the proclamation, uh, shall we say, was deemed null and void after the Revolutionary War, as far as, far as where you could go and where you couldn't. Pardon me, I just took a drink of water. Okay. That's all the questions we have right now. People are just chatting in how wonderful the webinar was <laughs> and how much they appreciate it. I've had a very good day. Thank you very much for allowing me to do this. And like I say, if all we've gotten is the contact information, that's all right, too. I think they've gotten much more than that. <laughs> so thank you all for attending. If you have any uh, follow-up questions, I'd encourage you to contact Candy. Her information's on a couple of slides here. Um, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up for today. Please take that survey that popped up and let us know what you thought. Remember that this webinar was recorded and we'll get it on the archived webinars page um, as soon as we can. And uh, if you're attending live, I'll get your certificate of attendance out within about a week's time. And don't forget those downloads in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen if you'd like to have the full-size version of the slides to keep. Once again, thank you so much, Candy. It's wonderful. Thank and so you for much, the so much great information. And I'm sorry if I picked on you, but you were just... No, not at all. I tried my hardest. <laughs> I've enjoyed the day. Thank you very, very much, everybody, and thank you for your patience as we've gone through these slides. And when you're ready to exit, you can just click the X in the top right-hand corner of the screen. Have a great weekend.